everybody. My name is Mark Martin Brass. My colleague, which is I am Sue Cabral, is not with us today, uh, but she will be available for other presentations. This is something we'll do not only for you guys, but for, for other people that are interested, especially guides and people that we consider to be like sort of the ambassadors of the bay. And so you guys are there and gives me two things. One thing that it gives me is observation. The first thing about science is observation, and, and you guys are there all the time. So when something happens and when something is noticeable or repetitive, it's good to have that way people watching. Uh, the other thing you do is you tell people about it, and you are, have that chance for one moment to have people completely in love with nature because it's so powerful that you are able to convince them that maybe we should either change our ways or maybe we should go in a, in a, in a, in a pattern that can save these things. That there's a reason for being that it's not only functional, uh, efficient, economical, but also well-being because people who see these are like little kids that they love it and that's part of it. Like we want to be uh, as helpful to you people who are actually helping the Bay. Uh, we are a nonprofit. we've been here for 35 years, and most of what we do is surrounding the Biomedicine Bay. You may not see a lot of it because a lot of it is also done in the research or in the policy that is done to protect and conserve it, and it is a very hard job because you've seen the world lately, this is not a lot of people's priority. So we figure we show you a little bit about some of the scientific research that we've done in the Bay Lake. You can interrupt me at any time if by chance what you came to learn was more about the organisms themselves and things like that. We have presentations that are different and we definitely have some educational material. But we can go into a little bit if you have a question because what we want is to get the right data uh, and the right information out. Uh, this is Ayam Tukabra, who did the show up at the end here. And she is the biologist that works in the Elizabeth Langhorn lab, which is here, and you might get to see it a little later. Mm -hmm. And this little lab that used to be a closet, uh, we have worked with bioluminescent organisms, different ones that are in the bay. Uh, lionfish, sharks, whales, leatherback turtles, and different things. Obviously, we only fit parts of some of these in here. Uh, we are going to, I'm going in English because I'm assuming all of you, right? So, do a talk about it. I can do both, I can, but I don't want to bore anybody. Uh, this is a source, uh, picture of the uh, a larger stage organism and within the, the samples that we took of the bay. So all the pictures you need to see today are, are from Puerto Mosquito. And, and it's fun stuff to see some of these organisms in the in the microscope and we have a plant from Bible counting and able to look at it. And it is important to understand that there is a whole set of organisms in there. That sometimes you see larva stage jellies and crabs and fish and eels, and then you just see dinoflytes of different kinds. And what's really incredibly amazing is they have one single species dominating on a pink bloom all the time here. Not a problem. Where you can go around the world and see the organism is not a problem. You can see an organism glow in a shoreline in the United States or Africa, Australia, or even the Oregon here. But you have a pink bloom here with an amazing amount of variables that stay in a real cool natural balance. And that's amazing. So in this case, when you're talking about the biomedicine bay, it is a combination of magic and science. And as the magic is being described by the science, you'll find that the science is also magical. It takes a lot for it to work. And, and so therefore it's very delicate and it's very unique. Coral reefs, mangrove uh, forests, seagrass beds, great coastal marine ecosystems, endangered in many ways, but much more abundant to the square meter area of biomass and base of the world. And we are currently involved in a project with Wellesley College of identifying the biomass and base in the world and their status and the biomass and body of water. In about six months, we'll be presenting that. We'll talk to you about some of the accounts. I'm going to meet Count Sabandas, the Mangrove Project. As little, we have a whole presentation on the Mangrove Project, so I'll tell you a little bit. Some of the genetic work being done, light pollution, and some of the other studies. 
these are also a different uh, picture. This is how we are seeing most of um, Dinoflagella, specifically Pyrolinum bahamense, mostly. I'll get back to that. It looks kind of like this. There's some trash and some debris that probably you have there that you can't see. But the area of Pyrolinum, one, two, three, four, five, and things. And then other things that you kind of have to decipher what they're. They're you know, about 40 microns when they're really big, so some, a micrometer is very, very small. It's microscopic. On the other hand, the other pyrocystis, the other organism that we were going to talk about, that you can buy as a pet, that's macroscope. Or you have uh, a copepods. They are mostly, yeah, mostly copepods are macroscopic, but there's some microscopic, microcrustacean. So it's almost there. But if you look at a microscope, you see them running around. <laughs> uh, this is a copepod. Artenia punza is the one that we have in the bay most of anything. That you see it is uh, uh, with a larvae here next to it, um, but this is the copepod that basically eats the dinoflagellates that we show people, right? And it looks like a fish. It looks kind of like a cockroach when you look at it from the side. Remember when we put it on a slide, you're kind of flattening it. So if it's like this or if it's like this, it looks like it's different. If you would turn it a little bit like this. It would have all these like shrimp-like uh, flaps, which are like appendages right there. Um, but it filters, grabs dinoflagella. Here is one of the big things about it being a defense mechanism, because when it grabs the, the pyrolinium, it will flash and show the cocoa blood or anything else. Very glad around theory, which is one of the theories. This is not completely figured out yet. And people in the in the biomedicine world fight over what it is. And why it's important. And then you have serration furca. Serration furca is a non bioluminescent dinoflagellum, which is abundant in the bay, way lower. And the only reason we bring it here is because some of the work we do with water quality parameters and conditions that go up is that we have seen that sometimes when heavy rain, a lot of uh, salinity decrease and stuff like that, serration. Where a couple of billions go up, pyrodinium biomass of operations go down. Not all the time, but it happens, and then that we start studying the microscopic world, which if she comes back, she can tell you a little bit. We have some historical data, uh, some new information. Later on, you can see the poster, which has uh, information. For the longest time, um, there was uh, information that people did randomly. Like I was involved in a study in 2001, had a lot of data. Two times a week, the surfers from below, uh, Carlitos from Jack Watersport was involved in that one. She was the one counting all that. That was a very lot of data. But that's the only one. Like before that, it would be like once a month, for four months, and things like that. So it didn't work here. You haven't got here. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and so, now, for the past few years, we have been able to do consecutive counts, and we're counting at night. And part of the reason we're counting at night is because we told you about that, more, you know, that uh, upward migration of the organism, so you have to kind of count on the top and the bottom and average them out. We like to count at night because it's more homogeneous, you know, more good. Uh, but also because it's way cooler to be out there and it glowing, you know, like, so we go out there in my electric clothes and I have sort of prepared a couple of things, uh, uh, some historical data analysis, uh, some recent counts, so you can tell people a little bit about it, some uh, averages based on recent February's throughout the last few years, and uh, some that have to do with the new records that have been broken there. So you get it. You. Okay, um, this image right here is part of our poster. We participate in 2019 of ASLO and we present the historic time findings of the data that we could manage to find about um, Puerto Mosquito. It's not a lot and it was very difficult to find because since 1960, 
nine is the first data that we get um, information about. And after that, there was no data until 96. Maybe there were visits to the bay from other scientists, but a publication with a number, we didn't find that. So it's not until 1966 when Hurricane Berta came around and the bay went dark. So that sparks the interest of some scientists in the main island and out of Puerto Rico that were working with um, Bayala Parguera in Lajas, is the most research made of a bio bay in Puerto Rico is about La Parguera. And through them, they came here because our bay went dark. And that study went for around one year, but it was not constant. And after that, it was one study here, one study in another year, but it wasn't every day or every week or every month for a long period. It's not until 2014 that we experienced a very strange climate. Our winter, it winter, goes from the last weeks of October up until maybe February. But in that year, the, the winter weather went all the way down to Jan, Jan, June. So the day was blowing at all for weeks. And we didn't know what was exactly happening. And that became our program right now. So mm -hmm. since 2014, there were um, have been the, the participation of Dr. Michael Ratz and Melissa Carter and Mark and a year later in 2015 I became part of that and since 2015 the Elizabeth Young Laboratory and the BCHP have been um, conducting the longest microarray January count in this biobay, and we don't know if there's another type of study like this one, but we go every <coughs> week, once a week, since 2015. In that period of time, since 2015, we experienced normal, low, and extremely high. So, in 2017, you know, Virgin Maria came to us and hit us as a category 5 hurricane. It was 9 hours here in Vieques and uh, they went dark again. I remember as a kid in 89, we experienced another huge hurricane, Hurricane Hugo. And the day went dark for all, for around six months. In that time, Vietas did not use the Bio Bay as a tourist attraction. The bay was uh, a safe port for our fishermen, as always, and that was it. That was it. The fishermen were, were the one who knew what was happening, and they saw that the bay wasn't blowing at all for more around six months. So when Maria came, I knew that that was what's going to happen. For how long, that's, that was the question. And it went around seven months without, um, we are able to see it blow. So that doesn't mean that the Pirodini Bahamense wasn't in our day, but at the depth we took our samples, we were, we were not able to find it. So for almost seven months, it was not detectable. After that, the bay began to glow again in April. Not glow exactly, the glow came back around May, but I was able to, to find some organisms in last weeks of March, 
first weeks, two weeks of April. And then the numbers just go high, higher and higher and higher. And I talked to Mark and I said, I don't know, but I don't know if I'm counting right, but this is crazy. Because we didn't see this type of numbers just in 2006 when the day was <coughs> Um, what was the record in 2006 around 1 million of kilodic amounts in a gallon and then in 2015 when I was taking the 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 crucial with Melissa Parker oh, the training course the training course with Melissa Parker she was able to count around 1 million again after that went around 150, something like that. That's very good, very bright. That's our norm. So from zero detection, it went up until March 12, 2019, and it was established the new record in the violin. Right now, I'm working to Reestablish the new record with Guinness, because that's our record. <laughs> but in 2006 was around one million. But now this, these numbers are in liter. Our record is 876,953 kilodinum in a liter. That's more than 3.3 million kilodinum bahamense in a gallon. That's a lot. That's a lot. And that streak went down until July in 2019. And after that, our weather, the peak of the season of European season, kicked in. And the number <coughs> went back to what you can say is our north, around 107. In a meter. But this number is just plain ridiculous. That's almost a million. Uh, almost a million in a meter. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. A lot. Some of one of the things that, that you gotta learn here that that's not fun for a guy because you want to be able to be exact. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that there is a major range in what you are seeing in a bioluminescent bay. Sure, when it's, oh my God, and you guys are talking to each other and you're like, are you seeing this? Yeah, you're talking with lower edges of records and things <laughs> like that, you know, and all that. And you're talking 500, 600, 7,000 <laughs> per liter, you know. That, that's kind of my thing. But at 24,000, the bay still looks great. Yes. At 100,000, it looks better. But the human eye is not a microscope, so there's a, there's a level of how it can look, combined that with light pollution, the clarity of the night. There's a range where the bait is good or great, and the number you see here. What we don't want you to do is give out a, a bad information or information that they're doing like, wait a minute, or scare people when they suddenly say, oh, it was only 50,000 per liter. It's not. You know, it, so you basically say exactly that. There's a range and it flows because it's a complicated system. All that I is best is this. Recent average is this. A good average is this. You don't try to be specific to say, oh, well, I'll always close that a million per liter because that will happen maybe five days out of a year. Yeah, and, uh, and the part when you say that Puerto Mosquito Bay is the brightest Bioluminescent bay in the world. It's not any kind of bay. It's the brightest in the world and had the world record Guinness since 2006. And I'm working to update that record because we crush it. Not we, the bay crush it in 2019. You had a question? Yeah. So, um, with saying around 200,000, like on a really bright, bright night, with that average around that, on a really yeah, bright night. Let's start out with one thing that's like sort of a, a problem. Science works in liters. Right. 
people work in gallons in the United States and in Puerto Rico and all that. So it's it's a problem, you know. But we, we, we have debates about this how to portray it all the time. So the first thing is how you're gonna portray it. If you can portray it in both and you want to do a conversion or generalize, go for it. Uh, but saying that 200,000 per liter is great, 200,000 per liter is excellent. It's not only great, it's excellent. <laughs> you know, 800,000, like, oh my God. You know, and that's not scientifically speaking, but I just don't want the standards of the records to guide you to believe that 200,000 is okay. No, 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 200,000 per liter is fantastic. Yeah, the 200,000 per liter, or it wasn't per liter, it was per gallon. Oh, per gallon. Yeah, that's so, you know. That'd be an average length. About it, it's great. Well, it's, like it, it also it's great. It's great, but it also varies. You know, like once you're going to 200,000, you're going to a 30, 40, 200,000 per liter. That's good. Way different than, than 107,000 per liter. So as you look at, for example, five years ago, it was the, the average was forty something thousand. Now it's a hundred thousand, two thousand and fifty. So again, it flows back and forth, and it's the reality of it. There's no way we looked at weight to try to condense it, but we would just be averaging all the years and saying something so vague. Two hundred, two hundred thousand in a gallon. It's around two Thousand in a liter, a little bit more than that, and that's that's an amazing night. That's an amazing night, and as you have been able to see, the the best part of the day is around the station. But we have that light to to signal that the station is there, is there and that takes away a bit of the globe. But around that part, the, the center of the bay is, all, is always going to be the brightest. Or most of the time, is going to be the brightest. Not always, but most of the, of the time. The entrance to the bay is not the brightest part. But Mark and I, had, had the experience that in that part, in the entrance, one night, one night the <laughs> organisms decide to go there. And it's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, it varies every <laughs> single time. I think one of the things you can do is, is to try to go to the current one. Like what he was saying. Like, if you can say, Listen, it varies, it's why, let me give you an example, it's been going very well, in 2019 the average was 100,000, 107,000, whatever you want. That, that's good to keep it up to date, it makes you a better guide too, but we looked at it in every single way back and forth, and because of periods of Maria, periods where we couldn't go test it, periods where it goes dark, it, it's almost like a dishonest to try to put a real average. To right. it. So, yeah, yeah, that's what I want to verify, because the way I say it is like a, it always varies, you know, there's spikes up, spikes down, but on an average, like a, on a basic, like, good night that's blowing pretty brightly, like, it, it, it does vary, but around, like, 100,000 per gallon. Yes. That would be more. Yeah. yeah. 100,000 per gallon that would be is, like, is the way in an okay situation. I mean, I hate to use these words like okay or anything like that. But look at the numbers you're looking at. Yeah, it's too yeah, 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 yeah. stark. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're going to stick to gallon, if you're going to stick to gallon, you should change the number you use. Right. And, and again, you cannot go wrong with data. So, what do you know today, for example? You know, and you can say it just like this, in 2019, which was a very good year, the average was 107,000. You could break up to 380 something thousand per gallon if you want. Yeah. And that's the truth. Yeah. Now you can then do the disclaimer, that's not how it is all the time. So uh, that, but, yeah, that makes sense then. So I definitely think the way it's been going recently, it's like super bright, around 200,000 will probably be accurate. Well, and, and you could reference today, you know, when in a good year like 2019, which looks like this year, it was 107,000 per liter, which multiplies up to almost 400,000. One hundred and five. Okay. Okay. So, so, you know, that's a different thing. That average is something. Now, uh, yes, you have a question. So, uh, for this, are you, was 2019 weekly somethings and then it's the mean across the year? Yeah. Okay. Uh, of one side. We yeah. do three, four sides. 
but we do for different reasons, and you'll see why. And she explained why we picked the second one to do it. But yeah. Yeah. Our yeah. average are from the second side that is around the station. That's in average is the best site always. Another day, not today, so we don't confuse you more. And we'll go into the lower part of that poster, which is the ecosystem model. Why? Apart from hurricanes and storms and stuff like what variables make it a good bottleness and bay? The winds and the things like that. How, how rain is always right. But again, you can't go wrong with real data. So if you tell them like, hey, 2019, it was real good year at Town of Dutta. It looks like that this year. Okay, that works, you know. I see a map, do you? This is 2012. Yeah. Um, before, here I have some data from 2020 that you, you know. The weirdest year in our lifetime. <laughs> and we have some numbers from before the, the quarantine began and after the quarantine was um, put lift up for us to go to the bay. Okay. So from January 1st till March 11th, that was right before the quarantine began, the max number of Pirodinio Bahamense registered in the bay was more than 255,000 in a liter. The, the, the lowest number registered was 7,045 in a liter. And the average was around 75, a little bit more, 75,000 in a liter. That was before the quarantine began. But then the quarantine came around us and for 13 weeks we were not able to go in the bay. So since in March 11 till June 16 was the next time we were able to go back to the bay. And these numbers down here are from June 16 till the end of 2020. So the max number I registered of the Rodinu was 482,407 in a liter. The lowest number I count was 38,543 Rodinu in a liter. And the average for that period of time was 146,060 in a liter. So you cannot do uh, average, an average from the whole year because it's not going to be real. Because we missed 13 <coughs> weeks. That's more than three months. But in that period of time, right after the quarantine lived up for us, actually, a year ago, we experienced the biggest Saharan desert storm we have received in more than 50 years, and that dust brings to our um, water nutrients and a lot of stuff that is good for the Pirelliuba Mese and other um, organisms in the water and for the land, and not for our lungs, but for nature, that dust is very good. And we experience the craziest um, Saharan dust uh, storm last year. So almost double of what we saw in the first part of the year. So that's why Mark said that there's a lot of things that it's a mix that makes this baby so special. And that's why it's so rare, and that's why we have to. Uh, really. And we always get too close to it, but we always go like more over the ground. Mm -hmm. So, 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 you so, you so right here, I have a real sample from um, June 1st. And we go to the bay. 
Friday, as Mark said before, once a week. And we go to four spots. It's very cool. I say in the Yeah, or sometimes. So we go to the library and we reach our spot that is marked with a GPS. So always we go back to the same spot. And with this um, cylinder of 1,000 milliliters, we dip our arm in around uh, one feet. Nine to sixteen inches, in between nine and sixteen. And we take out water, and then we take this other um, cylinder. Cylinder. Gravity cylinder in English. So we took from this 1,000 and we pour 90 in this cylinder. And then in here we're going to have always 10 milliliters of our preservative. And we pour our sample in here. We mix it carefully. And there's our sample. And then Mark came back to the lab with the samples. And the next day, I prepared the sample in a beautiful metal and I have to wait for at least 24, 24 hours and after that I'm able to see it in the microscope. Yeah, the mold method is a very old dry method. It's the painstaking, it takes the you know human to, to work with it. Uh, but it is very exact in actually telling you everything that was there. There are other methods that include the flow cam, that is a camera that counts and learns how to identify organisms. There, there are other ones that are a little simpler, that you just put a couple of drops in and try to multiply with some fantastic mathematics I don't understand. Uh, but the Uthermal method has a settling slide that she's showing you right now. There's a chamber. I stick it on here with water. And after I mix my sample, I pour it in, in this chamber and I cover it with a piece of glass. And in that state, I have to leave it for at least 24 hours. After that, I came back with a slide, a piece of, another piece of glass, and I cover my sample, and then I'm able to put it in the microscope and come. Uh, at the same time, we take a water sample with, this is a YSI, we just got a new one, but this is a multi-parameter sound that measures temperature, dissolved oxygen, salinity, uh, conductivity, which is how they get salinity, uh, it has the pH, and uh, the new one has the chlorophyll. So we drop it in the water next to the sample and get, when we used to have the station up and running, it did that every 50 minutes, so it was able to give us the past, the present, and the future of, of that sample. We don't have that anymore. But these are these are instruments that are used, and we let the citizen science use. Not the Uthermol. This is a trained thing that she does. But you can certainly see how how she she does it. So you add the conversion. So if you wanted to know, like she said, 3.3. There's that 3.3 per gallon. Uh, what people talk about 720,000, which is the Guinness record. Ooh. Blown out of the park uh, in 2019. That's a new record? That's a new record, no new record. No, right? No, that's the newest, the, the best. It's a record. 3 million? 3.3 3. 3 million, if you want to not say the whole thing. Per gallon. Per gallon. Now remember, we are transferring for you for the people's purposes. It's for leave. But we. As a courtesy to people, unless they're from, if they're from the United States or Puerto Rico, they don't really understand flavor. Indeed. Okay, so as I said before, we have been in this um, student study from since 2015, and we came here here because um, we have a blackout in 2014. And as you see here, I picked February because. In the past six years, is the month that is that show how these organisms can go up or just went down. And in 2015, the number average was um, around 9,000 
in a liter. But then the next year, it jumps up um, almost four times. So it was more than 26,000 in a liter, average the month of February. Then the year that Maria came in February, we experienced 22,000 as a average. But we can see the, the, the impact of the hurricane, because I began to see, for real, in, fe in February, some organisms, and the average was a little bit more than a thousand in a liter. But that was around maybe one organism in my whole sample. And then it came 2018, sorry, 2019, that it was the, the, this huge year of recuperation after the, the hurricane. And from 1,000 the year before, and 22, two years before, it jumps up to over 200,000 as an average in a month. That's, that's huge. But then, the two Februarys that came after this <laughs> recuperation period had been consistent. Over 81,000 in February last year, and over 77,000 in this February. So, here, as I said before, you can see that it's not a steady number, never is going to be a steady number, and you can go down the middle. This is, very, this is a very good month, very good month, way low or non-detectable as January and the months before this month, or just plain ridiculous. <laughs> and then it came these two past years that have been steady and very bright. Actually, we ex escaped the worst hurricane season ever reported in 2019. We escaped that. There were 30 um, systems in our waters, and we escaped everyone, everyone. So that's a huge part that come to play in, in the numbers that the bay is able to register. If we doesn't have this extreme weather, that would be very good for the bay. We still don't understand how some of these natural cycles work. We know hurricanes, for example, serve a purpose for a beam and different ecosystems. So, but the, the complexity of wildness and bay is still yet to be understood in its full. I think that goes well over anything anyway. So you know what? Sorry. You go ahead. You know what? It's yes, like five months after Maria. Uh, but uh, we are working a mango project, which is uh, basically a reforestation project after Maria in the mouth of the bay. We will go into detail more if you want someday. Uh, needless to say, we have two nurseries in an abandoned school we're refitting in Puerto Real, where we are growing all kinds of mangroves, uh, but mostly we have a VHS design for accelerating the growth of red mangrove, that is in effect there, built by VHS, Eric Bermuda, as you see on the top left. Uh, and we have Nature and Nura, you're seeing some of the destruction areas in that entrance where we're planting, you see her planting, that's about the size we plant them in. Once we grow them from seed, we go on the boats and we flag them and we flag other things, natural growth, we compare and we'll gladly involve you in this if you want at any point. And uh, you're seeing seedlings of bottom mangroves, which we're also growing. So we're growing the four species. We're also recovering species from places where they're vulnerable, be it because they're campsites or, or fire areas or whatever, and we take them from there, put them in our nurseries, then plant them in the bay. That, we've done hundreds of white mangroves that way. Uh, and we, yes? Can they spread from rhizome or only from seed? 
from like what? how do you propagate? Oh yeah, from we do it for seed Perfect. only, only from seed. seed. Yeah, and, wow. and there are four very different species. You know, a red mangrove is the propagule that you guys know, and we have some right here. You know, and and we that's our main player. That's the one we want the most uh, to plant. It. So we grow the propagule uh, into a plant field, right, into a little small tree in fresh water, sprouts, brackish water, gain some strength, salt water, full sun, then bay. So it takes a long time to grow from seed to it be able grow, to transplant? Well, we, but that's not the only way we do it because we also do spot uh, planting of, of propagules just like that. Okay. Or, or relocation of others or some that, hey, we just need some right here. But it could take six months to a year to grow one from the little. But we're already ahead. We did that a year ago. So we we are now about to collect again. We have hundreds of plants in waiting, and we're about to collect because it is. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, which species is doing it? What what brings the toxic? Right? There's different dying flies. There's different things. Even see what is a dying fly. It's a different type of dying flies that we got, but it's a bioaccumulation. Saxotoxic from a dying fly. Uh, coral from a dying fly. So that fly's coral a lot more than what we see. But we know this is a bad <laughs> But it yeah. glows too? The compressor? Yes. yes. Reddish. Glows red. Whoa. That's no, no, it creates reddish things that glow blue. Okay. okay. And, uh, and in that way it's called, it's called red tart. But has a little bit of reddish color to it. The all white water, all the water gets all red. The water gets all red, yeah. So, yeah. They, they, she's figuring out what it, it could be that we have these two in our bay, or, and they just go to this number. So she's trying to figure that out. You don't have to wear it. You can answer your question. We did have that comic of Spider-Man and the bay becoming a monster. That was really cool. uh, but, but really, we don't have a problem. She's not looking because we have a problem. She's looking because she's interested in the genetic sequencing of these organisms. Mm -hmm. Can you tell the difference in your samples? Uh, she can. Between the varieties? Yeah, I mean, you, you can a little bit. One of it is the apical horn is, is kind of cut off. I'll show you a picture with it. You can tell the difference a little bit. Oh. And, and again, this is electron microscope. She's not going to see this. This is a lot of money. <laughs> uh, but the horns are a little bit less pronounced. It is sort of flatter. Uh, and even in this, they pick two pictures where they look really different. From a lot of angles, it'll look the same, you know? If you weren't looking at this and, and take this sort of, maybe modify this one to show the difference. I don't know if they did, but it sounds like it. So they don't open the bridge, that's their mouth, right? No, they don't really have a mouth. Well, they have a pores that they can absorb things, and the ridge that holds on, uh, uh, sort of a flagella kind of thing. Well, they have the horns, they don't need anything to that, you know, it's just part of their design. And these are called sutures, and these are called pico plates. And then what you're not seeing, the, the actual tails, is because most preservatives burn them off. In order to keep this so well preserved, the, the probably formaldehyde, which we use and stuff like that, and it burns little things like that. So you said we have the compressor. No no, 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 no. She wants to know that. Okay. But she's again not coming because there was any problem, education, or anything. She's just interested in DNA. So the whales, those membranes, how do the name? The membranes are called TECO, T H E C A L, plates. T H E. Yeah, so if you go to the bathroom, you'll see a couple of cool terms like the TECO plates, the sutures, the horns. The flagellums, which are the tails, pores, nothing special about that, and, and on this one day we're working with the luminescence creation, which again involves the pores again. Yes. There was a medical then? No. Alright. Thank you. Akashiwo, uh, uh, she can tell you about because she started this. And it's also another thing you have to look at without being really wary, you know? Because people, we're just doing science. We're looking at things here and there. It's not a real... What's on the basis? 
it, it is. But I'll let you explain it a little bit. I just want you to know, like, you know, sometimes people hear some things and they're like, oh my god, this is happening, you know. Like, so we just tell them to shift some things there in the way. Okay, she was saying, what is another than a pilot? This one happens to be toxic. And this in our waters, not only in the lake, in the, in the property in the Caribbean. What happens is that um, normally in a year, in a year, maybe I can see 10 of them. In a whole year, maybe at best. But last year in January and in February for around four weeks, I saw more of them that, than usual. Actually, in one sample, in February, I saw around 14,000 milliliters. So I talked to the boss and to Mark, and I suggest that we should take a look and see what's happening with Akashimo. Because it's not normal for, for this organism to have a bloom. Or at least in the years I have been counting in the in the lab. It's not that I never see it, but I have never seen that much in one sample. So we took measures to to we decide to pick another um, sample spot that maybe people like you like the visitors can be near to that spot and we can check and see if we can find Akashiwo. Just prevent it. It happens that after February came March, there was no detection of, of Akashiwo and then the pandemic hit and we were closed until June. I didn't detect Akashiwo again until October, very low, this is the lowest count I can find. Then in November again, I didn't detect it, but then in December and January, I found the normal detection and very, very, very low. So if I skip the month of February, maybe 2020 was another normal year for Akashiwo in the Bay. But that week, I just, I just want to be careful and check and see what's happening with it. But apparently it was just a random blue that it happens that Mark went that day to the bay and picked a sample in the right spot. So, or in the wrong spot. Yeah. Or in the wrong spot. What levels would it need to be for it to be like harmful to us? Like kind of in a kind of area. Very high. It would have to be very high. It would, it would have to be a little prolonged, you know. Uh, so. And more than high for a long period. Yeah, we, we talked to our, our. We have several mentors. One of them, including this particular one, should probably mention, are from Scripps Oceanographic Institution of Oceanography in, in California, and they were like, you know, don't worry, keep looking at it. And so they do develop some really high bloom populations for a while, and we haven't talked about it. Mm -hmm. but, but I wouldn't, you know, we have not seen anything that would lead us to believe that we're anywhere close to that. No, I was just asking. And then yeah, what the it? specific number? I don't know, but I can find out. What does it do to you? Or what is uh, it? You know, it's like a narrow dog thing, but uh, it would be almost like the same thing as a red like sort of, yeah. Uh, uh, so I'll find out more about Kashiwa before answering because because I I know we we got little training. We just on know it. that it's a toxic one, and um, I always check on it. Yeah. Because it's part of our. And we chose. Device, and we chose. I have never seen that type of number, and that's why I take a special um, time to look for it. But the after other. that. The other thing you gotta see is like you're not really in, in touch with the water enough to have that much.